Celebrate mom for Mother's Day with help from Whole Foods Market. Whether you're treating her to brunch, dinner, or a nice gift, you'll find it all in one place. From May 10th through 16th, 15 stem bunches of tulips are on sale. Just $9.99 for Amazon Prime members. Plus, shop 365 by Whole Foods Market for brunch staples on a budget, including smoked salmon, the mini quiche trio, and more. For dessert, pick up a heart-shaped cake from the bakery. Only the best for mom at Whole Foods Market. Terms apply. Many Portlanders don't know that one of the most influential chefs and food writers of the 20th century was born and raised in our city. They might know about the prestigious James Beer Food Awards, but not much about the man himself. Like how this openly gay man living in an age of rampant homophobia started modern food culture as we know it. So today on CityCast Portland, we're going to change all that. In honor of James Beard's birthday, which is tomorrow, May 5th, we're talking with his biographer, John Birdsall. John wrote The Man Who Ate Too Much, The Life of James Beard, and he's here to introduce us to a wild, wild life cultivated and grown right here in Portland, Oregon. It's Thursday, May 4th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. So, you know, up until I saw the dramatized scene of James Beard and Julia Child uh, hanging out on the HBO show, Julia, uh, I had no idea that James Beard grew up in Oregon or that he was gay. It was, yeah, I had no idea. Because as soon as I saw this man come in and I was like, well, he's awesome. I like Googled him. I (laughs) knew who was James Beard, but I was like, wait, I'm sorry, the awards guy? Um, And that's when I was like, holy crap, he's amazing. But I also heard that there might be some controversy about that scene because Julia Child might have not just been the coolest person (laughs) to gay people. Yeah, right. I mean, I should say up front that that HBO show, they made it clear from the beginning that I guess much like The Crown, like they were taking dramatic license with right. actual events. And so this kind of imagined um, scene where James Beard hangs out with Julia Child when she's on book tour in San Francisco. San Francisco is a town of sensualists like us, <laughs> unlike dreary Boston, beans and <laughs> cod and the like. <laughs> and I'll prove it. I'm taking you both out to dinner tonight to my favorite restaurant in the Bay. The food is spectacular, the room is charming, and the waiters are delicious. Oh, well, I'm sold. (laughs) And then after, you know, the book signing, he takes her to this gay bar in the city, and she, they watch as a drag queen doing Julia on stage, just sort of, you know, melts her heart and teaches her how to do makeup and all this stuff. And it's just, that (laughs) was just just so so far. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, for one thing, I mean, I have to say like drag queens in the early 60s, like they were not doing like Julia Child. You know, they were doing like Judy Garland and, you know, much more glamorous. (laughs) Yeah, much (laughs) more glamorous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so putting that aside, I have to say that, um, yeah, you know, there were a lot of complexities about James's sexuality. You know, if you were are the most famous, you know, one of the most famous people in America in the 1950s and you're gay um, and your sexuality is kind of this open secret, there are huge complications. You know, someone like Julia was a dear, dear friend of his, but she just couldn't rise above just this sort of petty homophobia that that she would just kind of express casually and shock a lot of people around her, frankly. Yeah, because everybody was like, oh, we thought you were cool. Why are yeah, you we... sa- <laughs> yeah, why are you saying that right now? But I mean, their right, friendship right. was so special, they even had a name for it. They were called Gigi, right? Like, for short yeah. for Julia and Jim. So, I mean, right. it's clear she had like an arc. The only reason I feel like a lot of people even know about James Beard is because of Julia. And that's why I brought her up is because... James Beard's list of accomplishments are just, just I mean, it's there, it's more than what's even stated on the wiki page. Um, he actually hosted like the first national cooking show on TV. Right. I mean, he, I mean, this is an accomplishment to me. He got kicked out of Raid for being gay, which is a <laughs> well-known <laughs> yes. college year. But why? I mean, you, officially, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Like officially not for being gay, but um, but yeah, but that yeah, for being gay. Let's just be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why don't you think he's as well known as Julia Child? Do you think it's because of that, or I, you know, it's really because of television. He just wasn't naturally comfortable on camera with the, the way that Julia was. Just you know, this kind of luminescent presence yeah. on on screen, and you know, although he was you know, hugely famous in his own day. And his books, some of his books sold extremely well. Um, Starting in the 1960s, once TV really took off as this sort of main, main platform for Mm -hmm. people, James just sort of faded in the background. Right. I mean, he was based in New York for a bit, but he was born and raised in Portland. That's right. And I feel like his time in Oregon is what made James James. You know, you've maintained that Oregon had a huge influence on how we thought about food, which in turn created our modern food scene. Now, can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. So, you know, James Beard was born in Portland in 1903, and he was born into a really sort of difficult family situation. Uh, He was the only child of parents who really actively hated each other. Um, And so they basically, even though they all lived in the same house in Portland, um, they all ended up living separate lives. His mother, James believes that his mother was uh, a closeted uh, lesbian, which sort of added complications to her life. Mm -hmm. Um, But one thing that she was devoted to and that she instilled in James was her love of food and cooking. And then just being a boy out on the coast uh, in the summer with not much to do, um, you know, he would go picking for berries and he would go, you know, try to catch like baby Dungeness crabs on the beach. Uh, They'd certainly go clamming every year. So he had this deep, deep, intense experiential knowledge of what it was like to live in a particular place where the food had this enormous resonance. So he just kind of grew up in this childhood that where, you know, because there was really no, not much of an emotional sort of warmth at home, uh, food sort of took the place of this you know, kind of emotional life that that he really lacked otherwise. Oh, and I just wanted to point out too that this is a time when people were making jello molds and that was dinner. Like that was yeah. yeah this, so you're 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 like hinting at seasonality in a sense. Like the basis of like modern cuisine is just like what's in season. Right. Um, so tell me how that how because he moved to New York in the late 30s. Like what did he experience on that coast? You know, how did that set him apart from the New York food writers? Like, why did he rise to the top? Because he became like people wanted to impress him, you know? Yeah. So in you're right. He he moves to New York City in the late 1930s. You know, he kind of makes a living by cooking for his friends. So he'll sort of cater parties for this group of theatrical friends, most of them queer, uh, who he lives near uh, in New York City. And eventually starts a catering company with two friends of his, um, and they become kind of celebrated uh, in large part because of James's food. And at a time when the United States was really moving away from farms, moving away from farming, farming had this kind of, um, you know, tarnished reputation because so many Americans were moving to cities, Mm -hmm. getting jobs in factories. James really sort of carries this knowledge of farming, of what it's like to eat in a very small part of of the country that has this enormous bounty of food. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when he writes his first cookbook in 1940, um, he really carries with him that sense of being an Oregonian of being of having this knowledge of the West Coast that is really um, sort of disappearing in the United States, and eventually, by the time he's basically a household word in the 1950s, part of that is because he has really established himself as someone who has who has that in his bones, who has a memory of like what a real strawberry tastes like, right. um, what, you know, the the first peas that are harvested on the Oregon coast taste like. Um, and, you know, at a time when yeah. when the U.S. is is really touting the sort of gleaming supermarket yeah. as the, the, the sort of apex of American food, James has moved in a really opposite direction. Yeah. 
he had the palette of like a pre, you know, World War II America. <laughs> Just so yeah. sad to think of that, that they're like, oh, this palette, you know, tell me what's good. I don't know anymore. I'm just eating Kraft cheese. Uh, that's right. so sad. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like incredibly sad. All right, let's take a quick break here. And when we come back, more from John about James. Celebrate mom for Mother's Day with help from Whole Foods Market. Whether you're treating her to brunch, dinner, or a nice gift, you'll find it all in one place. From May 10th through 16th, 15 stem bunches of tulips are on sale. Just $9.99 for Amazon Prime members. Plus, shop 365 by Whole Foods Market for brunch staples on a budget, including smoked salmon, the mini quiche trio, and more. For dessert, pick up a heart-shaped cake from the bakery. Only the best for mom at Whole Foods Market. Terms apply. So your book has some really visual, beautiful stories about James' food travels in Oregon. Can you share your favorite one? Yeah, I th- I think one of one of my favorite incidents from James's life overall, um, and I think a great moment for American food and for Oregon food in particular, is this trip, this road trip that James takes in 1954. He's great friends with this food writer named Helen Evans Brown, who lives in Pasadena. And with Helen's husband, Philip, um, the three of them get into Philip's you know, Dodge Coronet convertible, and they drive from San Francisco up along the coast, uh, up to Seattle, and they make it their mission to sort of stop at every small, what we would call now like artisanal food maker, like cheese maker, jam wow. maker, baker, um, and sample all this food and take samples with them just to do this sort of research in basic American food. And I should say that, you know, in 1954, the highest, I guess, goal of American food was not to be American at all. It was to be French. French, yeah. yeah and, and so, you know, food writers for like Gourmet Magazine would sort of take travels all through France and write about, you know, the amazing cheeses and wines that they found there for an American to, to basically do that and to do it in a, in a place like, I mean, for any New York sort of food snob in the 1950s, you know, they're, they're not thinking about right. how amazing Oregon is. Mm-hmm. And so James, what James loves about this and ends up making the country as a whole love about it is that you know, unlike what you'd be reading about in Gourmet Magazine about traveling in France, the cheesemakers and bakers in Oregon are completely unpretentious. Like they're making yeah. foods for like a small local market. They're doing it because, you know, they can sell it locally. They think it's a cool thing to do, um, but they're completely sort of down to earth people. Yeah. They're not food snobs at all. And that's still to this day. I mean, that's what sets to me uh, the Oregon food scene apart. Like I've been to the wine symposiums here, you know, at the at the convention center, and you'll see like the best Oregon wines. The the people who make them come in, and they're just wearing their like little boots, you know, their boots and their jeans, and they're <laughs> right, just like, hey, right. hell, you know, they're just like real sweet, you know, no pretension. Right, right. And right, I don't this know. is not the Napa Valley, yeah, exactly. Uh, what were what some of his favorite Oregon foods? I'm curious. Yeah, well, um, so, you know, of course he loved Dungeness crab. Um, he loved razor clams. Um, he loved salmon cheeks. Um, oh. If there was one, yeah, if, if if there was one food really that sort of described his interest in the coast, um, it was, it would just be like salmon cheeks that were, you know, seared in butter um, and served. Yeah, really kind of rare. He loved strawberries from the coast. He was particularly excited about um, peas, about the sort of peas that would grow along the coast, along seaside. And he would always sort of say that the the length of time it took for the coast to get a lot of sun <laughs> in the springtime <laughs> yeah. would mean that the, that the peas would ripen over a very long period, which gave them uh, an intense amount of sugar. So he was really keyed into, you know, what we would call like, like terroir. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. yeah, the, the, you know, not just the variety that you grow, but the quality of the soil, the basically the taste of the soil in which something is grown um, mm-hmm. that really in- informs its its flavor. Yeah, its flavor profile. And I feel like he elevated America's terroir. Like they're just like, yeah, if you you get cheese from this place, it's going to taste different than like if you get it from Vermont, than if you get it from New York because of what the cows yeah, exactly. are eating and how and right. everything that affects 
uh, their environment. And I feel like that wasn't, we were, uh, like you said, people were just like, oh, we're nothing. What's France doing right now? Let's eat their cheese. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And this, I think, really gave Americans a lot of confidence that food that was produced not just in the United States, but also that there would be something delicious um, and unique wherever you live in, in in the country. Like you just have to not go to the supermarket, <laughs> yeah. get out of the habit of going to the supermarket. You know, we, of course, take all this for granted because we have farmer's markets, but farmer's right. markets did not exist then. You know, there were like some urban markets in cities, of course, but just that idea that this, you know, these farmers would come to your neighborhood on a weekly basis. Yeah. Um, th- it was, this was just a foreign concept in the U.S. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know that James Beard loved uh, Gearheart, Oregon specifically so much that that is where his ashes were spread um, over yeah. that, over that beach in particular, which is like so sweet. I just, yeah. and it, it really hurts my heart that also just to, you know, I, I talk to people around town and I'm just like, you know, James Beard is from here. And they're like, what? And I'm just like, his ashes <laughs> are in Gearheart, Oregon. Like, <laughs> he's the most Oregonian, you know, guy out there. Like, well, not anymore, but you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah, the most yeah, Oregonian sure. thing ever. Uh, like, what would he think of the foodie culture in Portland today? Do you think he would recognize himself in it? Um Yes, yes, for sure. I mean, you know, A, he had this kind of enormous, healthy, healthy ego. And so he'd be completely delighted that there are chefs like Naomi Pomeroy who, you know, really honor honor James Beard and his legacy in town. Mm-hmm. Um, so he'd be absolutely thrilled. But I think just the variety, the the sense of energy about the Portland food scene, and also that, like what we talked about with the 1950s, like that sense of kind of unpretentiousness, um, that sort of hardworking, um, you know, I'm just going to do something that I think is cool for my local community, uh, and hopefully people will appreciate it too. You know, James was always conflicted about living in New York City. Um, mm. He basically had to live there because if you're a food writer um, in the 1950s and 60s, it was all centered in New York City. Um, so he he had to be in New York City, but he always talked about Oregon. He always fantasized about, you know, leaving New York and moving back to the coast. Um, so there was something very deep. You know, he loved, even though he was thrown out of Reed College, he <laughs> felt like it really, you know, he carried a piece of that with him. He carried that sort of democratic, um, progressive, uh, really unpretentious spirit of 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 Oregon and the Northwest um, with him, and I think it it kind of informed all of the all of the food that he really loved. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate you taking the time and talking yeah, to us, introducing pleasure. us to one of the most uh, famous influential people from our area that most people don't know about. So, thank you very much. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I love talking about James. And now, our lead producer, John Natariani, with your microdose of news. Thanks, Claudia. Most of Oregon's Senate Republicans didn't show up yesterday, denying Democrats the quorum necessary to conduct business. It's a move that Republicans have pulled several times in recent years, but it's complicated by the fact that voters passed a new law last year increasing the penalties for just this type of walkout. Democrats say it's a move to stop progress on two bills, one focusing on abortion and gender-affirming care, and the other on gun safety. And after the abrupt resignation of Secretary of State Shamia Fagan this week, local politicos are all speculating about who might fill her job. Could it be Oregon State Treasurer Tobias Reed, maybe former Senate President Peter Courtney, or will Governor Tina Kotek just make a surprise pick? I guess we'll have to wait and see. For even more local news and events, sign up for our daily newsletter, Hey Portland. We'll throw a link in the show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. <laughs>